Happy Thursday, and welcome here to another edition of Husker on the Headlines. Sean Callahan, Steve Sipple. You can feel spring, man. This is great outside, isn't it? Yeah, it. it's, I mean, we're having a, all right, we're going to have weather talk now, like you're at Super Saver in line. Yeah, it's unseasonably warm, isn't it, Sean? We're, we're like <laughs> overdressed right now for Husker on the Headlines, but we got a great show on tap here as um, we work our way uh, through we think your five of the bigger headlines of the week. And I want to start here at number one, future scheduling philosophies for Nebraska. And um, head coach Matt Rule has discussed this. Trev Alberts has discussed this. I know uh, our, our friend and colleague Tom Chattel um, spoke with Matt Rule um, about this as well. Just kind of their philosophy going forward on scheduling. Yeah, Rule's philosophy. And, you know, Nebraska right now does have long-term non-conference series with Colorado, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Tennessee, Tennessee, and Arizona. Is Cincinnati in there? And Cincinnati, um, yeah, we got the El Toro Bowl coming up <laughs> um, next year. Not That'll this, be fun. In 25. Okay. The El Toro Bowl and Lucas Oil Stadium. That's a one-off uh, neutral site game. But, you know, could these games go away? Uh, Matt Rule, I think, would rather play three – kind of developmental games knowing how tough the big 10 is going to be every that's, year that's what he told tom yeah that's what he told but tom. what do you do do you get out of these contracts then if you're nebraska like what is you know the, some of these contracts question. are far down the road that's the question that's the question that a reporter sean callahan simple somebody should should ask trev it costs money to get out of contracts though right so how locked in are they would be a question. Are you, are you look, are you act? I mean, Sean, what, we'll just get down to it. Are you actively Trev Alberts seeking to get out of these games per your head coach's comments to Tom Chattel, which were, which I mean, to paraphrase Sean, he rules said, and again, I'm paraphrasing that, with the Big Ten as tough as it is, why play a marquee Power Five opponent that could beat you up in September and derail your season? It, well, yeah, der- yeah, could derail your season. Yeah, yeah. In a place like this, it does derail your season. Yeah, when, when it can. And so he he said, like, if you're going to play Washington and Oregon, now that Washington and Oregon are aboard, along with the rest of it, why play a game, for instance, against Texas? You know, why do that? Now, there's a lot of people, Sean, that this isn't the to me the interesting part of the conversation is is sort of a function of our age, your age, my age. And remember when Nebraska was this, we'll take on anybody anytime. We'll take on all comers anytime. Wasn't it didn't it used to be like that more, at least from the yeah, players? The parody hadn't hit college football though. That's the difference. You know, they had the biggest army with the most weapons and tanks back then. Now everyone's got equal armies. and there's Not no, everybody has equal armies. But our army's not – the Nebraska army's not quite like George's. That's what I'm, But I'm saying, like, Power 5 football teams – like, Iowa State was Power 5 in that era, but they weren't. Right. That's true. You, like, you could roll in there right. and play a poor game uh-huh. and, and win. Win 51-14. to 14. You know, they – I mean, Osborne had one of his worst losses in his career to Jim yeah, Walton. but it was a one-off. I mean, it was a one-off. I mean, Missouri, when when Missouri had Woody Woodenhofer, I can remember those games distinctively, distinctly, distinctly. They would come in, and I would, I would be sort of taken aback by how slow Missouri was compared to Nebraska. Like, there's no way they can win this game. There's just no shot. Even like in 99, Kansas almost beat Nebraska. Newcomb ended up winning that game in Lawrence in the fourth quarter. Uh-huh. Had, a, had a couple catches and a punt return. You just kind of always knew, like, Nebraska would figure it out and win those games. Right. So so you're suggesting it's different. But it's so. But Matt's comments to Tom were interesting. He's, as you know, rules very transparent. So he says, he says what he's thinking. And now my question to you would be, is what rules saying, does it jibe with what Trev wants? Cause, cause Trev is the businessman in this conversation. Rules, not a businessman. Trev's the one who has to worry about the bottom line. He has to worry about how many people are in the stands. And sometimes, I mean, some people are going to look at it and say, Hey, I don't know. Are, are we, are we really going to play Furman again? You know, are we got, well, who are we playing here? 
You know, I mean, we're playing UTEP in Northern Iowa. Can't are, are we going to have another? Or are we going to have a marquee opponent? Or are those going? Yeah, away? but what's not good is not getting the six wins, and they've got to build schedules to build, like like what Fred Hoiberg's done on Nebraska basketball. Right, they built a schedule to get momentum. Absolutely, and, and I think now here's the thing: where, just so you know where I stand, and where people know where I stand, I have said for some time, lightened of preseason. You're in the Big Ten. You're getting brutalized in the Big Ten. It's a tough schedule. I so I'm I am basically with rule. It's sort of a hard sell though to some people, like especially when you start backing out of contracts if that's what they're going to do. Which I don't know. I don't know that they're well. Gonna if do the that. SEC is staying at eight, and they will be for at least a year or two, yeah. you're at a disadvantage with the SEC already. Big Ten is, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think if the Big Ten is going to get guaranteed four playoff bids, which if this thing expands and, and changes, that could happen. It doesn't even matter anymore. What do you mean it doesn't matter anymore? You know, like the out of conference games. If if you know your league's going to get four playoff bids, so you you're saying that take an, care of business in your league, you're going to playoff. An bid. SEC team could lose an early game against a non conference Power Five team and not worry about. It. Yeah, because if you're fourth place in the Big Ten or SEC, you're going to get in the playoff. Right. But so rule now. Here's the thing. I wonder this, if rules tune would change, say Nebraska, say he gets to ne Nebraska back to being a, con a, a consistent top 10, top five team. I don't know if rules tune would change on this, but mine would. If Nebraska's back to where it's a consistent top 10 team, then I would say, if I were the coach, let's, let's play some big, let's play some big time non-conference teams. The Let's problem is you schedule these out so far. I mean, this Tennessee game was scheduled like God. decades ago. <laughs> a long time. I mean, and, and they've kicked the can down the road right. like multiple times. So um, what we know is Colorado's this year. The next year is the Altoro Bowl in, in, in Indianapolis. In Indianapolis. Um, they're playing Cincinnati, Cincinnati on August 30th. Okay, that, that's that, awesome. But they've already kind of lightened the load after that. They have Akron and Houston Christian. <laughs> I mean, I, I consider myself an Pretty expert bad. of college football. Yeah. And I, I never have heard of Houston Christian. <laughs> Nor have I. Now, hold on. So they play Cincinnati, Akron, and Houston Christian. <laughs> okay, now here's the thing. What if you said we're not playing Cincinnati, we're going to play Northern Iowa? Yeah, yeah I, would that would that go over okay? A 3-0 is 3-0. I mean, but. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. But Houston Christian, is, it reminds me of like a, a team that would be like in a movie. Like, a, you know, like there'd be like made up colleges, like big state, yeah. you know. And I've never heard of Houston. Houston Central. Houston Christian. I mean, like, I, like th that's kind of what they're going for. But after Houston Christian and the Cincinnati schedule in 26. Okay. Yeah. Where, where well, they have Ohio and then they play Tennessee. Okay. And then they have North Dakota. Then in 27. They have Northern Illinois in Lincoln. Then they go to Knoxville on 9 11 on, on 2027. So, and we don't know who the third opponent is. No, third yet. opponent not set yet. <laughs> um, That's enough. I mean, I would lighten it. See, if you're playing Northern Illinois and Tennessee, that third game should be a Houston Christian. I, okay. Big state. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for saying stuff like that. But I, again, I am bent the way rule is on this. Don't play Tennessee if you don't have to. Don't go to Knoxville if you don't have to. Don't do um, it. 2028, they play Arizona and Lincoln. They have South Dakota State on there, too. See, sometimes those games can be a, a little yeah, harder. Those, well, and who knows what FCS football will look like by that point. I mean, yeah, good point. I mean, the Power Five has just gone in there and robbed it. I mean, the good players are leaving to go up to power five. Now, in some cases though, some players off power five rosters are going down. down. So then Oklahoma in 29. Yeah. So yeah. that that's on the schedule. And that that's one of those game of the century kind of anniversary yeah. series. Um, and then in 30, Nebraska has Oklahoma again with South Dakota state in 31, they play Arizona and Tucson. So it's always fun to do how old you'll be in 2031. Yeah. No, I don't know. That's not fun for me. I'll be 51 yeah. in Tucson. Yeah. You might be living in Tucson by 31, and I'll I'm just not, come see you down there. I'm not, I'll be traveling up to the games from Paraguay and then going back. <laughs> 2031. <laughs> 2034. So they don't, they don't have any in 2032 and 33. Um, Oklahoma State, 35 Oklahoma State. But, again, if you're Matt, like, I can, you, can you, like, 
the average shelf life of a college football head coach right now is four to six years. Yeah, he's not worried about 20, like, 30. I don't five. like so I think we're looking at Tennessee. I think that's the one. Yeah. The El Toro Bowl is going to happen. Yeah. I just wonder if you would call Trev Alberts right now and say, are you still going to play this Tennessee game? What the answer would be. That this seems to be the one that would get blown up. The answer probably would be we're not commenting on scheduling. Because it's tricky. It's a tricky thing. And maybe Tennessee doesn't want to play it either. That could be. I mean, maybe they don't want to come up here. Like, right. they come up here first. Like, what if they come in and it's a madhouse and they get beat by Nebraska? Like, it, it, these are fascinating discussions because it gets to mindset. Where I'm coming from is Nebraska is still in the early stages. I don't, I'm not going to use the word building, but if, but if, but of becoming Matt Rule's pr- program, and if Rule feels like right now it's not in his in Nebraska's best interest to line up against those sort of teams, those those Power Five powerful programs, it makes sense. I have a feeling though, his answer to Tom was more strategic, it was more about the playoff. Why? Why we don't need to do this? The Big Ten, if we're successful in the Big Ten, that will get us in the playoff. But do you know who needs better non-conference games? There's three people. Who? Fox, CBS, and NBC. <laughs> yeah, they do. Matchups. And guess right. who's paying the bill on a lot of this? Ah, see, there you go. Those Sean. three people. Yeah. And so if you told Fox, hey, or CBS or NBC, would you want to air our game with Houston Christian? Right. <laughs> no. So and that's what I mean. That's where Trev is more. I mean, he's the one who has to deal with that. Tony Petiti would be like, hey, what are you doing Right, scheduling Houston Christian four times. Well, hey, coach. Well, I don't know that rule wants that, but um, Houston Christian. But anyway, it's it's a it's a fascinating discussion. Yeah, we'll be um in the, in the playoff expansion too. It's right now at twelve for two years. Right, but after these two years are up, there's a lot of things on the table to watch. Right, um, there's already discussion to expand it to fourteen, and then the Big Ten and the SEC. Um, want to exp- increase their auto bids. They would they would like to go to four bids. I mean, speculation is they would like a model. If there's 14 bids, four would go to each of those two leagues. So they would eight, get eight. eight of the 14. That see, I read that in your three two one column. That just seems almost preposterous to me. But they can. How the, can they make that stake? That well, what if Florida a, State's in the Big Ten? Well, I, I got it. I got it. As the more teams, they always want to flex. I mean, these conferences want to flex, and we want to say they got all the money and all the TV power. So I guess that's what it, that's what we're talking about. And if these leagues don't play by this, those two leagues could start their own playoff. Yeah, they have the leverage. Yeah, like, do you think the Big Twelve and the ACC, if Florida State's out of the ACC and North Carolina's out of the ACC, they have any leverage in this thing? No, I don't. I don't. I just. Th- what I always come down on this stuff is, and this is what I was thinking about when I was reading everything today, it's remarkably unappealing, especially for someone who once saw college football in all its glory. And now we're talking about this. Well, what if the SEC and the Big Ten just split off? I mean, wow. That's that's what it's You know who's to. getting the bad deal? Notre Dame. Well, yeah. So the current, the current model, yeah. you have to be a conference champion mm-hmm. to get – a buy. Yeah, they don't get a buy. They so won't get a buy in the race. Notre Dame to win a national championship will have to win four playoff games. No buy ain't happening. Yeah, it's no. not happening. Oh, well, I don't know about that, but so, no buy under so any circumstances. In the current model, if Notre Dame's number one in the country, they wouldn't get a buy. They'd be a five seed mm-hmm. because they're not a conference champion. Mm-hmm. Um, what if the SEC in the Big Ten make it where their payout model is higher than the other leagues? If they control eight of the 14 spots, they're going to control more of the money. Yeah, so correct. those teams are going to get a better payout than the other leagues. Notre Dame is going to get a lesser payout as well. How do you think Notre Dame is going to react to that? Not well. Not well. So will that be what finally forces Notre Dame's hand? To join a conference. If anything, I think if they joined a league, it would be the ACC. Really? I think it, it's a, it's safer for them. They're already kind They're of already in it. it. Yeah. And – Look, if Florida State leaves, it's set up for them to win that thing. Like, there you it, go. And then, but if they if they lose out on getting a buy, I mean, that's a big deal. I'll be interested to see what how the fans comment on this future scheduling as it applies to rules comments. As long as we get that trip to Indy next season, not in the twenty five season, you're you're happy. 
we'll take it one season at a time. <laughs> one season. And then in Tucson, when you come up and visit me from Paraguay, yeah. that's going to be a great year <laughs> for me. I'll have to but... go up north for those games. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might be in Tijuana still. No, I'm not messing with Tijuana. <laughs> All right. Uh, before we take it to headline number two, um, thank you for joining us here on the Husker Online Headline Show. Uh, Husker Online Headlines brought to you by Omaha Steaks. And right now, Omaha Steaks has the 50% off semi-annual sale. Um, it's going on right now. Get 50% off site-wide and save on mouthwatering favorites today. Go to omahasteaks.com slash Huskers. Shop the semi-annual sale where you can load up on all your delicious fa- flavor you crave for half the price. From tender, juicy, butcher cut filet mignons, mouthwatering uh, hamburgers, comfort classics, and easy-to-prepare meals that are perfect for a busy weekday night. Plus, an added bonus, you'll get eight free hamburgers from Omaha Steaks um, on select packages when you shop at omahasteaks.com slash Huskers. With Omaha Steaks, the possibilities are endless, endless flavor, and endless value on incredibly scrumptious sides as well, uh, desserts. They've got it all. 50% off right now at the semi-annual sale at Omaha Steaks. Uh, they've got a guarantee as well that you're going to love this product. Um, otherwise, you'll get your, your money, unconditional money uh, back. Go to omahasteaks.com slash Huskers. Get eight free Omaha Steaks burgers with select packages when you stop the semi-annual sale. Hurry, because the deal won't last long. That's omahasteaks.com slash Huskers. Okay, let's go to headline number two. Um, we'll talk NIL because okay. it's a busy time of year. It's the dead period in recruiting. So coaches can't go out. You can't host recruits. So what are you doing right now? You're kind of on an NIL sales tour. And Thursday night, we're taping the show here Thursday. Nebraska is out in Phoenix for the second year in a row with the 1890 Initiative Collective. Matt Rule, Tony White, Marcus Satterfield. They are running an NIL fundraising event out there. And, and the reality is this is a big part of college football now. It is for a lot of schools, not every school. Uh, but, but, yeah. It's, it's coaches go and raise money so their players can be paid, right? That's what we're talking about. 1890 puts this on, and they, I mean, I would say 1890 runs it with with the coaches on hand because the the donor, booster, donors, boosters want to see these coaches. It'll probably be pretty fun, right? You get a, you get to talk to the coaches and all that. But, yeah, the coaches have to do this now. I imagine it's not the only function that Rule does. And I imagine he has contact with donors and boosters. He has to, I think. That's Yeah, it's part of the job now. Part of the job. And, you know, last year they did the same event, and I know it was successful, but this is a big deal. I mean, as far as getting the money. Um, and NIL is changing, though, and, and there's a lot in play. Right. Go to the legislative. And thing. so, like, right now for NIL – um, you know, there's, there's, there's changes in play and the biggest change is things are set up now potentially for the future where Nebraska or other big 10 institutions and even sec institutions, well, all institutions, right? Well, the sec in the big 10 banded together to form that advisory group. Okay. I'm and sorry. essentially they want to make it where they are allowed to be involved in NIL and be involved in the payments and use their money. Um, and Nebraska, as a state passed the first bill to kind of move things in that direction. LB 1393 was introduced on February 12th. Yep. Um, I was actually uh, with state Senator John Arch this week. And we talked about the bill um, that they have on the, t- on the desk right now. And mm-hmm. essentially this bill would allow Nebraska to be involved in NIL directly mm-hmm. right now. They mm-hmm. can't be involved directly and they have to kind of keep a hands-off approach Governor Jim Pillen, also a former Husker player, um, is fully behind this bill. It's going to pass. There's no doubt. I, I don't really see anybody that would vote against this mm-hmm. um, at this point. So that's really kind of what's next. And, you know, when will this go into effect? Sometime by the summer, maybe. But how quickly can Nebraska increase their involvement? And what does that do with the collective and, and kind of their involvement? Right. You know, like. Right. I still believe you have to have the collective's involvement in some way. I mean, the Peds have given so much with this collective and the boosters involved. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think you just want to shun all that now. I wouldn't think so. So this is 
this is what it is. LB, as you said, 1393. It would clarify that institutions in Nebraska would be able to compensate a student athlete for their name, image, or likeness if allowed by a college athletic association policy change in CAA, a court order or settlement agreement. Should such a policy change take place, the bill would clarify that NIL compensation of a student athlete does not inherently make an athlete an employee of the institution. That's a big part of this. Because when you were talking about this would enable the institutions to pay the players, the uh, the automatic question in people's mind is, okay, so now are they employees? It would be public record at that point if they were. Right. But they but this bill stipulates that, no, they would not become employees of the institution. It's, it's all – and now this is where I'm sure people, some people watching, they get confused by all this. And I, I rightfully so. It's Do all states have a, a bill in their house of whatever it is like this? No, they don't. So it's, it's a state-by-state state thing. It does get very confusing. I understand why people are confused. This is pretty clear-cut, though. The, well, the one part of this, though, that's not clear-cut Um this bill and i don't even sean maybe this is just maybe they just felt like they had to include this part um but this bill defines hold on a second um oh it says under this bill universities in nebraska unl you know is the one we're talking about would be able to assist student athletes with their nil endorsements through legal support and access to department resources is that even a thing anymore? NIL endorsements for Caitlin Clark's of the world, like you know, like let's say you had Dylan Raiola, like okay, the, that yeah, the school could directly, okay, you know, partner with him and you know, help and, him and, pick up Misty's or and Dylan Raiola could have advertisements maybe in the stadium. Okay. You know, like, I think there's things that you could do, okay, that you're not doing now, or the school can be involved, but hmm. I. I wonder if they understand how many headaches are going to come with this from the institution side of it. Like I just know being involved, covering collectives and watching things, you deal with a lot and yes, you do. the general public. So like, what are you talking about? Just people wanting more money. And yeah, I mean, it's like running a company. Uh-huh. Everyone that works for you wants more money. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, I know. And literally players, will go to a coach or go to the collective the week, you know, Sunday or Monday after a game and want more money. We've seen it. I mean, yes. when we were doing interviews over the last few years and uh, we've popped by, I mean, there were, there'd be guys waiting to go in the collective office. Mm-hmm. Guys who maybe have a veterinary, a vet bill due or something. Well, and a lot of times it, it might be a guy that, you know, the phone, they couldn't get someone to answer the phone for them. So they just have to show up in person trying to, I mean, because, you know, it, it, it's just a, a different it's deal. Great. It's not, it's the setup is to say it's imperfect is understating the matter, but it's imperfect. It's yeah. Imperfect. And, and NIL though, it's not really NIL. It's more roster value. Right. And, you know, these players are paid a roster value through a collective contract where, you know, they do duties for the collective NIL really is what Caitlin Clark's doing at Iowa mm-hmm. and what Jeff Sims did for a little bit on some of the things here, like with Amigos and Acres Equipment and those things. Um, but you don't see much of that anymore. No. There's a lot of liability and risk to use a college student for a business endorsement. Sure there is. I mean, for one thing, he that student athlete might underperform to a large level. Or mess up off the field. Or mess up off the field, yeah. Which God is worse. Forbid. Yeah, which is worse. But then it then it's imp- in, impact on recruiting is really fascinating. Mike Boyton, you don't may not recognize that name, but he's the Oklahoma State basketball coach. Really quick, he had a he went through this soliloquy this 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 week about how he recruited Cade Cunningham in 2020. Cade Cunningham was the number one basketball player in the country. He recruited him the old fashioned way. Just got to know him. Spent four years and spent four years getting to know him, and and. And beat and beat Kansas and beat North Carolina for the services of Cade Cunningham. Well, what Boyton said this week is, I wouldn't even try to do that now, because somebody would just say, "Hey, just I'll pay you five hundred thousand dollars. Just come to our campus for nine months." 
That's recruiting now. I think that we used to talk about how how valuable it it can be to a program to have a great recruiter or a set of great recruiters. That's no longer as important. It's not. Well, and you you heard Adam. It's not longer, it's you not heard what important. Adam Silver said this week about how NIL has affected the NBA. No. So essentially, because the NIL money is so great for these top players to go to college, the G League and the developmental league of the NBA can't keep up with the money. It's suffered probably. And they've, they've taken a hit because of NIL. And he said, it's causing us to rethink the G league model because they're not getting the players. Some of the players. I mean, I can think of individual players, the center at North Carolina, for instance, that stayed in school and is probably making, well, he's making much more than he'd ever make in a G league. I mean, so yeah, I can I totally understand. I never even thought of that till right now. Well, and the NBA only has two rounds in the draft. I mean, right. so it's a huge risk to go pro. Yeah, it is, and and a lot of it's not, and not as much of it of the talents coming out of colleges anymore. It's coming from overseas. I mean, if you look at the draft, look at how many players are coming from overseas now. Wow, it's I never even thought about the G League ramification. The, the the ramifications NIL would have on the G League. So to give you an idea, the G League was a major factor because they, they could sign they were signing high school players like yeah. Bryce McGowan's told me in this very office a couple of years ago NIL had just started and you know he didn't make near what he'd make now right but he said Sean if the G League would have offered me a contract at a high school I would have taken that really he didn't he didn't have that offer really had to go to Nebraska for a year it's so different but man. now the G League is chopped liver. I mean, mm-hmm. the G League can't compete against Kansas money and North right. Carolina money and, and a lot of places. money. Yeah, a lot of places. We could just keep going. I mean, I mean, do a, do, do G League players even make a hundred grand? I don't know what they make, so I don't want to go there. Yeah, I'm a fill time here. I want to I want to Google this real fast. <laughs> fill time. That's what I fill do. time here. That's what you're, I do. Pick it up. Like are, a you, are you a little down today? Am I a little? No, I'm not a little down today. It's kind of like a like what? a seven version of Steve Sip. I want the ten version. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, oh yeah, G League players right now uh, only make like forty grand. Oh God, yeah. No, so I mean, come on, guys. I'll pick it up <laughs> so, a little bit. I'll pick it up a little bit. If you're staying, I, I wish I could think of the guy's name that stayed at North Carolina. He's the center. He, he played in the national title game last year, and I was, I was, it was curious to me why he stayed in school. But it, then it's really not so curious because he's probably getting paid a million dollars. So like, just, I can tell you this confidently. Josiah Alec makes more money than a G league player. Oh God, really? Yeah, he does. Really? I mean, all of the transfers they brought in pretty much make a hundred grand. That's just my, that's just my feel. And what I know from what I, on the NIL, you now G league guys making a 40,000. Yeah. So Adam Silver's right. They can't 100% like right. they're not going to compete against that. Well, you're certainly not going to get as good a player in the G league right now. I mean, and, and unless something changes, but, and by the way, I am bringing it at more than a seven level. I will just make that very clear. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. What's next? All right, let's next headline. The headline. I'll pick it up a little bit. Number three, Nebraska basketball gets a win on the road. The Huskers go into Bloomington. They get the sweep, Steve Sipple, the double sweep over Indiana, 85 to 70. And, you know, imagine being like, an Indiana fan or an Indiana Double media sweep. member to, to just stomach that Nebraska basketball swept you. I wonder, I think they're having a harder time stomaching the effort level that their team shows. I'm not taking away from Nebraska at all, but Indiana, Mike Woodson has trouble at Indiana. They, they have material. They don't have guards, though. They couldn't hit shots. They, they missed free throws. And the effort was, effort was bad. Oh, there, yeah. The free throw shooting thing really is not a good look. I don't know. I don't. I hope I can verbalize this right. They they're, they're a sixty six percent free throw shooting team on the season. Indiana last night they're terrible, um, and I just for the state of Indiana, which is a basketball haven, how how they I just guarantee they don't tolerate that very well. I mean, there's eighth grade junior high teams that shoot much better than sixty six percent from the line. So anyway. Nebraska is in a very strong, I'd say a very strong position, in my opinion, with four games left. Robin put it really well earlier this week. Nebraska would have to play itself out of the NCAA tournament at this point. I don't see that happening. I was interested in reading your 3-2-1 column. 
that you 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 say I think you said it's most likely that they would go two and two down the stretch, maybe three and two one. and two is a given. I feel like three and one could happen. Four and zero. Oh. I mean, four and zero oh could okay. easily happen. Yeah, two and two is a given. Three and one seems very likely, or four and zero oh, pretty pretty likely to me. Nebraska right now, in my opinion, is really dangerous. They're a dangerous team. They were dangerous even when they lost at Illinois. Even losing at Northwestern, I still thought they were dangerous. Now they've won three in a row. They've won by 20. They've won against Michigan. They won by 19 against Penn State. They won by 15 against Indiana on the road. Now you're seeing what I was saying even when they were losing to Northwestern and Illinois. They're dangerous. If Nebraska dangerous. finishes 12-8 and eight or 13-7 and seven in the Big Ten, 13-7 and seven be winning out, 12-8 and is 3-1. Fred Hoiberg might be the Big Ten coach of the year. It would either be Hoiberg or, or Collins or Painter. I don't know why. Why Collins? Why not? I mean, their net better ranking, record than Nebraska. Their net is like fifty-eight. Uh, it would be Painter, Collins, or Hoiberg. I I have a hard time thinking that Collins is going to get it. Really? I mean, they're they one, were in the NCAA they're tournament. One last game year. better than Nebraska right yeah. now. I mean, yeah. And they split, so yeah, they split. So you know, you're you're probably in bounds there. I just think it'd be one of those. Three. But if Hoiberg finishes twelve and eight, he's going to get some momentum for coach of the year in the Big Ten. He, yeah, yeah, he's got some momentum right now. Uh, again, though, you're right. If they win zero and four, he's not going to get coach of the year. But Tomonaga, the way he's playing too, I was asking Robin, like, will he get some first team? I mean, he's going to be a second teamer, I think for sure. But will he get some first team? votes i don't know i was interested that the analyst working with kevin kugler last night at one point said that casey is the best player on the floor he stated it as fact and i thought about it and i was like you know what he's right casey's the best player on the floor he's the best player out there like, that's fascinating to me because there's a seven footer out there there's six ten guys out there Little K says the best player on the floor, but he is. That spurt he had in the first half. She was unconscious. I mean, in the history of Assembly Hall, how many road teams have a little guard that could do that in that place? I don't know. He's I mean, that that was that step back in the corner. That yeah, was he, ridiculous. I mean, if you're Indiana, you just throw your hands up. Like, what do you do? Oh, it's hard. He's hard to deal with. I watch it really close. They they tried to put that freshman guard Gabe on. Cups. They could he couldn't hang oh, with him. Gabe Cups finished the game 0 of six. Um, no points. You know, Casey. The only saving grace for Gabe Cups is he had no turnovers. Uh, yeah, he couldn't guard Casey. But they Trey to, Galloway, the other guard, had uh, six turnovers. They had to take Cups off of Casey. Couldn't he? Couldn't deal with him. But, so you're, he's really teams face guard him the whole court, and he still gets open. He's a master at it. He's become a master without the ball. That's that's. The thing about Casey, all you can do is is tip your cap to him at this point because he's getting heavy defensive pressure. He's getting a lot of, I mean, they're allowing a lot of contact on him, um, and he still shakes free, still gets himself free. Also, credit Fred because Fred, I and I have been the most critical in this market of Fred probably, but the one thing I never criticize about Fred is his ability to get shooters open. He gets them open. One well, just. Kese from Japan, obviously, and, and just the the way Japanese athletes, baseball, and now Kese in basketball, the, the way they they learn the fundamentals of the game, like you see it in baseball, how fundamental Japanese baseball players are. Like each row, it's funny you say that. I agree with you, except Bruce Weber said something last night, fascinating. You know, he's the former Kansas State coach who's on the B, he's a BTN analyst. I hope I got his first name right, Bruce Weber. Yeah, Bruce Weber, former Kansas State, coach. former Illinois head coach too, and Illinois. You're right. He said. If I'm co if I'm te if I'm camping with young kids, I am not showing him what Kase does because he does a lot of stuff wrong. Shoots shoots with his body not square to the basket, all different angles. He, I wouldn't show him what Kase does, but he can score. He can score. But when his arm and his wrist gets a like around the rim, he knows how to angle the ball. Yes, he does. To get in the basket. Oh yeah, he. It uses his body exceptionally well. How many times have you seen his shot get swatted? Very rare. Not very, not very often. He uses his body really well, and he has to be in supreme shape because he never stops moving. He has to work really hard to keep himself in condition because he never stops moving. That's why a tournament game intrigues me because they're going to play a team that doesn't know how to play him. Right. Now, right. No, 100%. 
now there's film they can yeah i mean but big 10 teams know him yeah no you're right nebraska's scary because it's not just k say because bryce williams can beat you because rink can beat you if they play like because, last night they can win it they can beat anybody right we've seen that We've seen that during this stretch, particularly against Michigan in the first, what would you say, 15 minutes against Michigan when Nebraska led Michigan 43 to 13. I mean, you can say what you want about how bad Michigan is. They're still a power five team, and Nebraska led them 43 to 13. No, Nebraska is is scary because of their prowess on offense, and now they're playing pretty good defense at times too. All right, let's take things to headline number four. Uh, second leg of the in-state tour uh, will take place on Sunday. We'll be in Lincoln this week, Steve Sipple, at the um, Chris Flat training facility. We were at uh, Steve Warren's place the week before. Um, got another good lineup of teams lined up. And you, first time you've been a part of this, but we, we do our best to kind of move through as many of the top players and coaches efficiently um, right. to get accurate measurements, pictures, yeah, people um, are wondering what it is. It's a, it's a media day, essentially. Yeah, so you, the high school teams bring their handful of their best players. The coach comes. It's an interview opportunity. For instance, Jackson Carpenter will be there. The, the kid from Wahoo. Um, say his Connor name. Booth. Connor Booth will be there. I'm interested in both those guys. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really a tremendous service for the high schools. I mean, it gets a lot of the word out about the teams. And so, and it obviously helps us a ton. Yeah, and we'll get the teams I've got coming in this week. How many? Uh, I think 14. Lincoln Southeast, um, Lincoln Pius as a player, Lincoln East, Lincoln South, um, Lincoln Southwest, Wahoo Newman, Waverly, Norris, Ashland Greenwood, Stanton, Nebraska. Um, they have a lineman uh, to keep tabs on. Bennington will be here. Lincoln North Star, Fremont, Blair, and Lincoln Northeast. So, um, you know, last week was kind of your big Omaha one, and we had 113 people come through it. Yeah, and so people wonder who we're talking about. Well, we're talking about Tyson Terry. We're talking about Caden Vermont. We're talking about the coach at Millard South, Ty Wisdom, who has a team that's absolutely loaded, and they'll take that team to Arizona to start the season. I mean, you the one if you, if there's if you haven't if you didn't take away anything from last weekend. Take, or if you're just going to take away one thing from last weekend, Millard South's the team to beat. They're loaded. Millard South is loaded. And they know it, too. You yeah. can just sense it. But, like, they walked in there, and, I mean, they they moved the room. Yeah. Ty Wisdom is a sort of – he carries himself with a lot of confidence, and it really makes an impression on you. Millard South is the team to watch this year. And they've got some tra- – I mean, they've ruffled feathers a little bit. they got some big-name transfers to come in their program. Isn't that funny the way you say that? It's just like college. they got some big-name transfers, like Jamal Banks, like – you know Isaiah Nail. Look, I've grown up in Omaha, and I I know how recruiting in the town has worked. I don't think it's ever been where it's at right now. Yeah, it was. That was one. It was an eye opening thing for me to be there on Sunday in Omaha and get an idea of that that situation. Like to hear Mark McLaughlin of Platte View talk about his big his tight end, uh, Ryman Ryman Zebert. Yeah, and tell me, I'm just glad he stayed here. And you would say, okay, babe in the woods, don't you understand where he's come from? I, I needed him to explain that. Like, what do you, what do you mean? Well, I mean, there's, there's a handful of coaches in the Metro that tried to get him, you know, for their team. Oh, really? Really? And he stayed with us and that indicates trust. He, he, he appreciated that that tight end who's being pursued by Miami, Florida University, Wisconsin, Nebraska, 18 teams have visited Platteview that he that he thought enough about Mark McLaughlin and his staff and that team to stay with them. Well, and here's the deal. Like by the time he takes a snap of football as a senior, his recruiting process will be over. Yeah. Everything's gonna happen for Zebert pretty from March to July. He'll take his recruiting trips, yep. you know, go around and meet schools. Coaches will come back on the road. More than likely, Zebert will be committed somewhere by July 4th. Oh, wow. So at that point, what's it matter where you play? Right. That's a good point. But boy, that but you've put into perspective how quickly this is going to move forward. Right. I mean, it's February 22nd. So what we do at the in-state tour is we try to get ahead of that. Right. We run on the dead period yeah. and we kind of set the table right. 
for what the next run's going to be. And, mm -hmm. you know, Nebraska's made eight offers already in the state for 25 alone. So it's, um, and this week, you know, like you mentioned, there's going to be the two Husker offer guys there, Jackson Carpenter, Connor Booth. I think what will come out of this tour is we're going to learn about two or three or four maybe new names to watch. Okay. Okay. And they might be younger names. Okay. But that that has always been what the in-state tour has been for me. Like, I'm okay when the coaches bring the young guys. Okay. Because I mean, it, it's more work to see more players through, but I want to get a jump on the names. Yeah. And, so you tell them to bring your best players. And I I purpose I want to enter in the data myself, even though it's time consuming, because I want to I want to learn every name. Mm -hmm. It's like a computer. You program every name in mm -hmm. to our system, and I'll never forget them at that point. So yeah. I enjoy, even though it's tedious to build the pages and learn the players. Um, then by the time the season rolls around, you're ready to go. Well, just tell Kit and Carly that you need some time. You need some office. <laughs> it's been time. a rough week. I mean, I I sp spoke all over the state this week. Yeah, you need to hand off some sick. of those to me and Rob. Um, <laughs> joking. But yeah, you yeah you need some time in your office by yourself. I just need I need like two days of just leave me alone. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I, they're coming. Yeah, good. Um, so we'll, we'll get. But I'm looking forward that um, Sunday, and then I'm gonna go right to the hoops game. So yeah, it's Nebraska plays Minnesota at five thirty. So we run the teams through from like ten to three, and then I'll go right to hoops. Five thirty, five thirty, tip off. That's gonna be nuts. By the way, yeah, already sold out. Um, all right, final headline, and we're gonna have some fun because we talked about scheduling and playoffs and things kind of changing oh, yeah, over yeah. the years headline five I'm gonna go fun here with you steve sip on the offseason your favorite husker bowl game memory and i want to say games you've covered not games you watched on tv so you, you know naturally you'd be like oh the johnny rogers game of the century or something but no games that you were a part of the bowl coverage week um you go ahead first all right well i got two can we both have two um and my two you go ahead my two that really for me, the 01 Rose Bowl, which was the 02, the 02 Rose Bowl in the 01 season, just because at that time, I mean, it was the pinnacle. I mean, Nebraska was in the national championship game. They had a year that season, they played Oklahoma yeah. and Notre Dame. That's right. In Lincoln. That's right. Both were college That's game right. day games. They played Oklahoma and Notre Dame in Lincoln on college game day, and Oklahoma was ranked what? Yeah, it was it was like a one versus two or yeah. a two versus three. It was like Something a like that. Yeah, it was a basically a one versus two game, but oh just God. that season, that game, and and I don't know, like it was a reality check though of how fast the table turned on Nebraska once college football had changed to kind of this pro recruiting influence, and I credit Miami with what they did on that team. Yeah. Uh, with Butch Davis and then Pete Carroll yeah. when they came into college football. Yeah. They changed college football to more of a pro kind of draft approach, development yeah. approach. That was Butch Davis's recruits, but that was Larry Coker's team. Yeah. Coker was the coach, but Butch Davis put but it But they recruited and built that Miami team like a pro team, and then Pete Carroll did that at USC. Uh -huh. And then Nick Saban started doing that at Alabama. Yeah. Um, and, and that was different than how Nebraska had won. They uh -huh. didn't build teams that way. And it was a reality check that week, but just that game itself and seeing, you know, 65,000 Nebraska fans yeah. in Pasadena. Yeah. It was 65,000 fans. I know. Out there. And it's as gorgeous as it's cracked up to be. And no, now they don't want, people don't want to hear us talk too much about that because you hear that all the time. But it is. I mean, you hear it all the time because Pasadena is gorgeous. So and we that were setting is gorgeous. This would have been, God, what year would this have been? 2019 in the summer. We were on the satellite camp trips. Yeah. Um, it might have been 2021, 2019. Um, we were at FIU. Butch Davis was coaching FIU. Okay. okay. And didn't really talk to Butch. He, he wasn't real friendly. He wasn't? No. Um, but he Ken, was at FIU. Um, yeah, he was the head coach. Yeah. And that probably wasn't all overly friendly. Ken Dorsey was in between jobs and he was like essentially the facilities AD for FIU. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> now, and I'm he's, sure he's taking us around showing us stuff and i'm thinking to myself this is freaking ken dorsey, dorsey. <laughs> i said i said ken i don't know if you know how much pain you put on nebraska like that game like was pretty painful it was over at halftime yeah and it was but the the number of media that were there too like for me as a young reporter mm. it was eye-opening just because <laughs> that was a time where all the national media would travel to, oh yeah it was way different way different, way different time and yeah 
Uh, what's your other one? My other one was the 05 Alamo Bowl against Michigan. Oh, interesting one. Why do you pick that one? Um, Because it was a lot of fun, and it was honestly a game Nebraska really had no business winning in terms of talent. Michigan was far superior, but you give Bill Callahan and Zach Taylor a lot of credit. They figured out a way to scheme Michigan and beat them. And, you know, they, they kind of warmed down a speed and, and, you know, Taylor took a beating that game and just Zach. the way that game ended. I Do mean, you remember how the game ended? Yeah. Zach Bowman um, and Titus brothers ran that guy out of bounds after they were doing lateral after lateral, Michigan, lateral, lateral, lateral. It's one of those deals at the end where you're like, Oh, wait a second. Are they going to get this to the end zone? Remember that? And, remember and that? Herb street and um, Mike Tirico were the announcers. Yep. With Aaron Andrews, I mean, it was. You, li you liked going to San Antonio, right? You liked the Riverwalk. Is that what you're trying to get to here? You liked the Riverwalk. It was. I mean, the Riverwalk was always a good time. It was super fun. It's beautiful. I mean, it, Nebraska fans like that was peak Nebraska fan. Like oh. San Antonio Riverwalk. I mean, they oh. would take that place over. Any Alamo Bowl was beautiful. Any of those was beautiful. I hope with the reshuffling of bowl games, somehow the Big Ten gets back with the Alamo Bowl. But I fear that the SEC will just take it. Oh, great, because Oklahoma. Yeah, AM, yeah. Missouri, makes sense. Arkansas, makes Texas. Sense. Makes sense. Like they're the natural. Yeah. That sucks. That sucks because it was fun going down. So there. you, Those you could have an SEC Big 12 Alamo Bowl. Those trips were fun. The Alamo Bowl is a fun bowl for fans because it's there's so much to do. And it's so nice. And out. there's lots of hotels. And it's nice out. It's nice out. You're wearing shorts. Okay, my two favorite. It's pretty clear. Um distinct differences i mean i'm not going to belabor the point too much the um, of why the 96 fiesta bowl after the 95 season is my favorite Versus florida it, yeah and it's per partially without going down memory lane it was my first bowl that i covered so it was that but it was more than that they won obviously but it was fun because i covered the I covered the Florida team a lot. I mean, they, they I was kind of the Florida beat guy for the Journal Star. So I got to know Spurrier. And it was fun getting to know Spurrier, going over to the practice. He'd make fun of me. Um, it was that that was sort of fun. Um Stoops is on that staff, right? Or was yeah, he, yeah, Stoops what? was a DC if I if I'm yeah, Bob Stoops was the DC, if I'm not mistaken. <sighs> um I think that's the case. But anyway. Anyway, the other thing that I'll always remember was calling back to our desk, Sean. This is the, Carl Vogel. If you're watching, he'll verify this. Keg, Keg, Kegler. I'd call back and say, "Hey, this is not going to be a game," and they'd be like, "You're crazy." I was like, "No, this is not going to be a game." Here's why: I'd say it. I'd go to those press conferences, and they'd bring in a linebacker that was like six one two fifteen, and they'd bring in a nose tackle that was weighed two sixty. And I said, this is not going to work. They 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 don't have the they don't have the size that can handle Nebraska's physicality up front. They can't. They're not going to be able to do it. I said this is Nebraska will blow them out, which sounds really pathetic for me to say now after they won sixty two to twenty four. But I knew Nebraska was going to win that game because um, they just were so much bigger and more. Physical. And Bob Stoops didn't join the staff till the next year. Next year, thank you. Then the other one. And you're going to scoff, but I always say it. It's the independence. But here's why. <laughs> I knew you were going to no, say no, that. Here's why, though. There's a reason. There's a good reason, actually. It was novel. It was a bowl. So I got used to going to these very nice bowl game trips where you're in, like when you went to, well, you, you referenced the 2001 Rose Bowl. I was in L.A. for 13 days. I was in Scottsdale for that fiesta bowl for 14 days and you stay at these beautiful hotels and it's gorgeous everything's taken care of you don't worry about a thing well then all of a sudden now you're in shreveport you're in freaking shreveport and you're at a kind of a so-so hotel why are you whispering and, and and you go and you go up to the stadium for the first practice as a beat writer and players come out and thank you for being there jamal lord uh, T.J. Hollowell and Darren Diedrich greeted me and Rich Kaipust and said, hey, we appreciate you guys coming. Because they probably thought as they were lifting these little weights in a little part of this little stadium, I don't even know if we're getting media coverage, but but they did. And they, I'll never forget Jamal, Jamal Lord, T.J. Hollowell, and Darren Diedrich coming out and thanking us for, 
for showing. You want to hear my Independence Bowl story that year? Yes, I went, um, and I, I didn't cover the week. It, I did, this I, was two thousand two. Two, yeah, I covered the game and got down there early. I went with a friend, but um, I rode down with Vershawn. Vershawn Jackson rode down with us, <laughs> and he had kind of. Why know, did he do that? Well, he wanted to go. Yeah, and we were doing radio stuff back then at sixteen twenty. When he I was, was no longer on the team. No, he's done. Yeah, and and he was tight with guys on the team back then, and. Um, he had kind of like his, his, it was his car wasn't a car you'd take on the road trip, kind of, you know, had the rims and stuff. Right. And he came and met me at my mom's house in South Omaha and he parked, like we had to park the car in my mom's garage. Oh, nice. <laughs> we, he must have had a nice car. Oh yeah. I mean, he's like, could he, so my mom let him park it in the garage. We drove down, uh, Vershawn was with me and, and who um, else? A guy named Elliot, um, Elliot. <laughs> a, that guy named, to, a guy named Elliot got went to college with and yeah. the three, it was like the Three of us drove down to Shreveport together. Yeah. And it wasn't a good, I mean, the game wasn't good. Nebraska lost. Oh, they should have won. That was the, like, they called, they they misread the signal on that fake punt. I'm not saying the punt, I'm not saying the guy who threw it, but he he made a decision on his own to throw it. He audible to a fake and it wasn't there. Right. He audible. Yeah. Like, he, and he, he airmailed it. He airmailed the punt. Like, he had the ability to make a check. And it's like one of those things, I'm guessing you never make the check. He made the check. And then, if I'm not mistaken, he airmailed the pass. He threw a pass too high. So yeah, that was there was. I remember. I remember the guy I was working with. One of the guys, Kurt McKeever, said, "We got to get to the bottom of this." And Kurt got to the bottom of it. It was a check. It was an audible. Yeah, it wasn't called by the head coach, no. and it hurt him. Well, and, the other thing about that game was that was Steve Peterson's first day on the job. It was. And if you remember, he was up in that press box. Yeah. In, in Shreveport. I mean, we're in Shreveport at this stadium after, see, what, what I was getting at is, what, what were we the year before? We were at Pasadena at the Rose Bowl. So the it was such a profound difference. Going to Lakers games and Lowry's prime rib yeah. to like the highlighted trip for the players of the Independence Bowl was a tour of an Air Force base. Yeah, and I didn't even do that, but uh, yeah, I it was just so much different than what I had been used to, all these big-time bowls. And now you're at this little, it's a little stadium. Did you finally part ways with the luggage they gave us? I did that, but they gave us that bag. A garment like, bag. A leather garment bag that I had for years. Oh, you tra I mean, it was kind of like you were traveling with that thing for 20 years. Right. It was beautiful. Black <laughs> garment leather bag. It was beautiful. <laughs> it was beautiful. I yeah. So, no, I, I remember that. I remember that trip fondly. It was fun. Shreveport was inter in Shreveport was interesting. That's an interesting town. What freaked me out about Shreveport, because I had never been to Mardi Gras or any of that stuff, but how you could just like drink on the street out there. You could drink a, a guys would have a full can of bud. Yeah. It was open container. Yeah, open container. Yeah. And then the, the casino element was big. And in, in that era, casinos weren't everywhere. And I remember Josh Brown, the former NFL kicker. He won like thousands of dollars on the craps table. <laughs> uh, why am I not surprised at all on that one? Um, yeah, that again, it wasn't the game wasn't particularly memorable. It was a Manning, it, you know. Archie it, was there. Yeah, Archie and come on, help me. So it wasn't Eli. Eli Manning was a QB. Um, so I don't know. It wasn't that. It was just. It was just. It was such a. I guess it was because the pressure wasn't great. Um, I remember the first day I was there, though, was when, correct me if I'm wrong on this, that's when they hired Pelini. I mean, it wasn't official, but it was basically official. Archie was extremely. Is that right? Is that, that's, that would have been right. Um, I think was Pelini came into the picture. At that after time. the, well, after the NFL season, right? Yeah. So, so that the I remember. Bowl game, the bowl game would have been before the NFL season. Well, I, so I don't think they hired Bo until the Packers were done. But his name had surfaced. His name had surfaced. Oh, and I was thinking Bo's name didn't come out till more January. No, it surfaced. December? Yeah, it surfaced. Because I can remember being down. Because the coaches' clinic in January is when the hires got made. I can remember being down in a cramped hotel room, kind of half pissed that I'm writing about Bo Pelini at this bowl and, game. But, um, yeah, you're right. Because I, when I talked to Barney Cotton this summer for the book. For your uh, book. Um, Barney said that Bo interviewed him at the – um at the coaches convention that's the first time they had met so that was early january yeah so yeah so the yeah no it's no i know i know that's what way it went down this was for defensive coordinator though do you understand what i'm talking about this wasn't bo becoming the head coach this was oh two after he had parted ways with craig bull but, yes after frank had parted ways with 
yeah, and Bo is named Bo name Bo's name quickly surfaced. Quickly surfaced. And the connection there was Monty Kiffin. Frank yeah. called Monty. Monty called Pete Carroll. Yeah. Pete Carroll recommended Bo Pelini, and yeah. then that's how the the circle began. Right. And I'm telling you, by the time Nebraska got to Shreveport to begin preparations, it was all but done, if not done, that Pelini was going to be the defensive coordinator. True story. So a lot came out of that trip to Shreveport. They're all, they're all, those bowl trips were always very busy. Well, and a lot of people, what people don't understand about a bowl trip is, and we haven't been on one in a long time, but a lot of people come around. You know, like you come to practice and you 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 run into former players mm -hmm. that you hadn't seen in a long time. And that yeah. was that's like, you know, I remember one year we're in Jacksonville and Rich Glover's at practice. Right. There's a lot of that. It's just you know we haven't done it in so long and it's. It's sort of disconcerting. Those bull trips were great. They're great for the program. Ugh, they Sean, used to run like high school coaches clinics at the bull practice. Remember yeah, that? All yeah. those coaches would come. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're great. I don't know. There's a, I hate to say this, but it's kind of a different time now. Yeah. I mean, I it won't know. be that way no. when they go back. It probably won't. No. It won't. Like, remember the Best Buy mean? shopping sprees that they'd go on on these bull trips? Oh, yeah. I mean, does that even matter when you're getting NIL? No. Like, how excited those kids were to have five hundred dollars to spend at Best Buy. Yeah, the swag. Yeah, the swag was a big part of it. Not now. It won't be. Yeah, I don't even know if you, people do that bowl gift story anymore. Remember, they used to always like. Yes, we. That was part of it. But no, like no, I know exactly what you're like talking. Like this about. year, I didn't see it. Oh yeah, this no. I don't think you. I don't think those. I don't think that's a thing anymore. The bowl gift nil. Yeah, <laughs> but all right. Well, we we yeah, really just two old guys reminiscing. We just kind of went old guy. Um, on headlines here but that that's a fun way to talk at the offseason here. i enjoy doing that i do too those are yeah we'll do more of that we'll do more of that all right well um if you're not a member of husker line we got a great deal great time to get on here as we gear up for spring practice ncaa basketball baseball everything going on try us out for two months for one dollar simply use promo code n u one to try out husker online two months for one dollar Signing off here for another edition of Husker Online Headlines. For Steve Sippel, I'm Sean Callahan.